Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I just um, want to introduce myself. I'm Charlie Lofton, lead pastor here, and really glad that you are worshiping with us today. Um, I discovered something, you know, and, th- and this happens, you know, as your kids get older and they start, you know, they get a little more honest kind of about, you know, their experience and recognize something, found this out a couple of years ago, that apparently when I'm giving a dad speech to them, I become a little, we'll just say, loquacious, verbose, use pretentious vocabulary words, and then finally, uh, I guess after, you know, doing this for 15, 16, 17 years or whatever, it's like, hey, Dad, like, n- we, we never know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, and, I, and, and when I preach, I try real hard, you know, I try real hard to make sure that I don't use words that people don't know, and that if, and if I if they make sure to define words, and apparently I just have this pent-up need uh, to, to, to use, you know, you know, obnoxious vocabulary words, and I do it with my kids, and so anyway, they... They, they told me, and you can just kind of see. Yeah, I, I, I thought, you know, when they were glossing over, it was just because they didn't want the speech at all. Um, but it's apparently there's parts of it that they're just missing. But honestly, um, you know, the, the speech sometimes for, for the dad, anyway, you, you, this may just be part of the struggles of having a pastor dad too. Part, but the speech feels like more important to me, right? Like I, I, I need to give the speech about what you did and why you did it and why we're not like that and you can't and here's why and all these things. And you can just tell on their face, it's like, please just stop. And we just stop all of, will you just give me the punishment and get out of here? Like, this is, maybe this is the punishment, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the goal of parenting is not just simply to modify behavior. You know, you do something bad, you get punished. You do something good, you, you get rewarded. I mean, that's something, but that's not the goal. The goal isn't just to kind of modify behavior. The, the goal is discipline. The goal is to take a heart and, 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 and try to shape it. And, and what I'm afraid of is that in church, that's what we do. We're just trying to modify behavior. Hey, here's, there's two lists. Here's one list. This is the good list, and got, this list is the bad list. And so we spend all our time, hey, Hey, do the things on the good list. Don't do the things on the bad list. If you do things on the bad list, bad things will happen. If you do good things on the good list, good things will happen. And, and, and all we're really doing is, is trying to modify behavior. When in reality, what God is wanting to do is he's wanting to completely renew and reshape our heart. And so that's why kind of we, you get the name of this, this series, Sit, Walt, Stand, and kind of the, the, the overall outline of, of Ephesians. I mean, there's some things you need to sit here and you need to listen to. There's some things that you need to understand. Before we talk about the things that you did that you shouldn't have and the things that you should be doing that you're not, there's some basic principles here that you need to sit and listen. And you need to understand. And then we can talk about what you need to do. And then we can talk about the dangers that are out there that you're going to have to stand up against. But in the meantime, you need to sit here and listen. And Mark kicked this off two weeks ago, and basically where Paul's talking about, man, one of the struggles that we have comes from the fact that we're kind of relying on our own resources when, when it's God's riches and power that are offered to us. And there's no obstacle that we can't uh, overcome if what we're relying on are, are God's riches and God's power. And then last week in the first part of Ephesians 2, we were talking about, and Paul was just reminding them, hey, you remember that before you became to faith in Christ, you were spiritually dead. And the dead can't do anything. And the only hope that you had was to trust in a God who raises the dead. And he did all the work in that. Dead people can't help in resurrection, right? He did all the work. He saved you. He created you. He did all of this. And he's got this plan for you. But first, you're going to have to realize it's God that did all the work. It's God that's doing all the work. And it's God that's going to continue to do the work. You need to understand that before you start trying to live this life. And he's continuing on here in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse um, 11. And starting here in, um, in, in verse 11, basically he's going to be talking a little bit about the, the, the conflict between Jews and Gentiles. And again, to make sure that we're all on the same page with vocabulary words, a Gentile is essentially just a not, not a Jew. So there, there were Jewish people who were God's chosen people, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. And then there were Gentiles, who are everybody that's not Jew. So Jews and not Jews, and not Jew is, is a Gentile. And so what's going to happen here is this is a message that's really tailored for 
um, kind of first century Gentiles, the people who kind of understood and knew and experienced the Jews as God's chosen people and were isolated from that. So there's a very particular message that he's giving to them. You fast forward 2,000 years, and here we are. And I think there's, there, there are some very important principles that we're going to glean from this, but it's going to be a little bit different than maybe what the original audience was taking in. Ephesians chapter 2, <clears throat> starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Now pause here for just a second. What he's talking about, again, we're talking about this division. There's God's chosen people, the Jewish people, and then there's the Gentiles who were excluded from that. He's talking about that exclusion. And of course he, he brings in kind of this primary indicator, which was circumcision, And we all know what circumcision is. It always feels a little uncomfortable. It's coming after 2,000 years. It's just like a Bible word, right? And we we don't want to talk about what it means. And I don't want to talk about what it means. And if you don't know what it means, just ask a neighbor and we'll just. (laughs) But basically, it kind of became this. It was this symbol that that, that God gave to Abraham and said, hey, this is going to be a sign of the covenant that you will do this to your your sons on the eighth day. And it, it became this kind of powerful symbol for them. And so it really was kind of a dividing mark between God's people, the Jews, and, and, and the Gentiles, right? Okay, back to verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So he's talking about there used to be this division. There 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 was the Jews over here and the Gentiles over here. And that Jesus really, he came in part to kind of to break, to break that barrier, to break that barrier down and, and to build this kind of one people. And I think it's important for us to kind of understand this idea theologically because there's some, there's some things that they would have known that, that maybe we don't know. Because I think a lot of times we have a lot of confusion um, about what it means that God had a chosen people and, and it feels weird, it feels exclusive, and we don't, we don't understand it. So if you go back to Genesis chapter 12 from the very, very beginning... When, when God calls Abraham, we need to understand kind of what the world was like. And we'll just kind of describe it as kind of really tribal, this kind of tribalism kind of world where there were all these different tribes. There really weren't nations so much as we think of nations. There were some, exa- some, some counterexamples of that. But there were really these tribes, and each tribe kind of had their own God. And so sometimes the tribes would, 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 would be in conflict. And if one tribe defeated another tribe, that showed that their God was greater than this God. And so God is looking into this situation. He's like, man, how do I best communicate myself to this world? And so he takes this guy, Abraham. There's no such thing as a Jew at this point. He takes this guy, Abraham, and says, I want you to leave your tribe. And I want you to come over here, and I'm going to create a new tribe in you. And you're going to be my tribe. And I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless all your generations to come. And I'm just going to bless you and multiply you in just in all these incredible ways. So we're going to start this new tribe. And I'm going to bless it. But that's not all that he says. Because what he said next is, I'm going to take this tribe, I'm going to bless you, and through you, the whole world's going to be blessed. All the other tribes will see and be blessed by this tribe. 
And so his idea was to kind of go into this tribal world and say, I'm going to make my tribe, and I'm going to bless them in such a way where that blessing will spill out, and they kind of have this missionary purpose to take this blessing and, and to give it out. And through that, I'm going to be able to reach all the world, and the whole world will know that there's not you know, hundreds of tribal gods. There's just one God. And then unfortunately, most of the Old Testament is a story of uh, the Jewish people's failure to do that. They, they took the blessing and became very isolated with it. They, they, they took the privilege that came with it and became very selfish with it. They, and they allowed that the pride and the privilege and the blessing of that to make them arrogant and isolated rather than being a blessing to other people. And I think we, as 21st century Americans, should totally judge them. Right? Because we don't have that kind of attitude at all. We never take the privilege and the blessing that God has given us and become selfish and prideful with it, right? So we're just going to spend the next few minutes just judging them and feel good about ourselves and walk away, right? No. Because, here's the thing. What what the Gentiles, the, the Ephesians, what they needed to hear in this message was, you used to feel like them. You were othered. You used to feel completely isolated, but Jesus Christ came to bring unity there. And, and, and now there's just one, so you don't have to feel isolated anymore. We don't connect as much with that. We probably are not a group of people, by and large, who feel isolated from the blessings that God offers. But this principle, which was true for them at that time, and is true for us now, is the same, is that in Christ we need to be very clear that there is no them, there's ju- it's just us. That's, that's what, that is the point that Paul is trying to make here as he's bridging the gap here between the Jewish people and the Gentile people. There is no them, there's just us. And so for the, for the longest time, the, the Jewish people were us and the Gentiles were them. And now what Paul is saying to a group of people who felt like they were them, that they were othered, hey, there's, there's, there's just us now. But here's the thing. 21st century, primarily middle class, primarily white church, here in the Bible Belt, do you feel like an us or like a them? If we're going to be honest, we need to recognize that really in our life, most of us have been us. And the message for us is going to be a little bit different than what the Ephesians were hearing. You no longer have to be afraid. You no longer have to feel isolated. You're not them anymore. But for those of us who have spent a good portion, if not all of our life being us, there's a different message. And we need to make sure that we are very clear on that. We need to make sure that we are very clear of the point that Paul is trying to make here. That there is no them. Just us. And all of the thems and all of the others and all the people out there that have felt this, it is our responsibility, just like it was the Jewish people's responsibility. The fact that the Gentiles felt othered was a failure of the responsibility of the Jewish people to take the blessing of God to other people. And if there are people in this world that feel othered, that is our responsibility to make sure that the blessing of God goes to them. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of look at three different places, three different places where I believe that not necessarily you, I don't want you to feel like this, I'm just, I'm just thinking, man, man, I'm just ready just to come both barrels at you people, right? It, this is really, this is big picture all of us. This is some challenges that I believe big picture that the church has in three areas in which we need to do a better job of making sure we communicate us. And here's the thing. You're going to like one of these three a lot more than the other one, and you're going to wish that we spent one week just on the one thing. And I feel that too. I've already preached this sermon once, and, and I felt bad about all of it. Like I was like, I wanted, to, I wanted to keep going. And so there are some of these things that are really important that I promise we will come back to at some point and give a lot deeper attention to. But we're just going to kind of just spend a little bit of time in all, all three of these areas in which I think it's important for us to make sure 
that there's no them, that there's just us. And they kind of grow, I think, in their controversial or, I don't know, anyway. All right? So there's no them, there's just us. And the first one is this, regardless of what church you go to. Regardless of what church you go to. Now, I don't think this is particularly controversial anymore. I mean, there are some places that I think they still have some level of arrogance and exclusive, exclusivity to their church. But I don't think this is landing in a bad way with you. He's like, yeah, hey, you know, people that go to other churches, it's fine, right? You know, it's cool. It's great. It's great that people go to other churches. We like people that go to other churches. We're all on the same team, right? I, th- I think that, by and large, that we get that. And I think it's important that we believe that. And I think it's important that on a regular basis that we make sure that we state this. Because one of the things that Jesus said was that people will know, people will know that we're followers of Jesus by the way that we love each other. And sometimes the best that we can do is love the people in the room, but we still badmouth the people who go to that other church. You know that other church, right? That other church that wastes money in ways that we don't like and is is stuffy in ways that we don't like or is, you know, does weird things in their service that we don't like. They're weird, but we love each other. Let me tell you what. The, the non-Christian world doesn't get that distinction. What the non-Christian world sees is Christians don't like each other. And what I'm telling you, we like each other. Some of my best friends in, in northwest Arkansas are pastors of other churches. And I love them. And I've had an opportunity to help them. And many of them have had some taken opportunity to love and serve and help me in some, in some really hard times. And, and, and we love, to, and all together we are God's people in this in this world, with the same mission, reaching people. There's an illustration, it's a relatively new one for me since I've come here to northwest Arkansas. Right? I think sometimes historically the way we viewed churches, other churches, is kind of like Lowe's and Home Depot. Right? You ever notice? It's kind of weird. Like They always like build across the street from each other. Right? right? And, and, and you know what they're doing. Right? And, and there's a competition there. If you go to Lowe's, you did not go to Home Depot. And Home Depot wants to figure out how to get the people who went to Lowe's to come to Home Depot instead. Right? They're, they're, there's, there's a limited number of people that are buying these kind of home improvement kinds of things, and we need to get to come to our store, not their store. And sometimes that's kind of how churches view each other. There's this limited number of people, and I don't want you to go to that church, I want you to come to this church, which is a false way of looking at it. The better way to describe it is there's a handful of people here in our church that work for Procter & Gamble. And they work for Procter & Gamble, and they own, there's only one reason why a company like Procter & Gamble would be in Arkansas, right? To, 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 to service Walmart, right? And so they're all here, and they have a joint mission. We are going to sell as much of our stuff to Walmart as we possibly can. And you know, diapers and toothpaste, and everybody's kind of got their own different department. But we're all working together doing different things for the same mission. And that's what church is. Because there are going to be some people that are going to walk in this door, and you may already be feeling that. And if so, come talk to me afterwards, and I can, I can, I can try to help you. Right? You walk in here, and you think, this is just loud. It, it was dark. Now it's really weird. <laughs> and I'm telling you, there are softer, brighter less weird churches out there, and, and I would love to recommend four of them to you. And, and they're great, and we're all on the same team. But there are some people who's like, man, I, that, that, that seems a little formal, that guy seems a, li- a little stiff, and this feels a little more relational, and, and this, this is helping me. And so all of us doing different things are all reaching the same group of people. We're not competing over the people here. I'm not trying to get them to come here, and I'm not they're trying to prevent you from going there. We're all together trying to get the people who are still sleeping <laughs> to go somewhere and hear the powerful, life-changing message of Jesus. And so there's no them. There's just us, and it does not matter where church you go to. Not only does it not matter what church you go to, it also does not matter what the color of your skin is. Now, I would hope that this is just as non-controversial as the first one. That if I say that God loves all people equally, regardless of what color their skin is, I hope that everyone knows that in their heart that that is 100% true. And if you do not believe that to be 100% true, I pray right now that God will do a different work in your heart. And that you will, you will overcome 
whatever bitterness and lies that have been taught you and that you've experienced, because this is 100% true. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about why it's true. It's just true. God created everybody, and all people are, are equal and equally loved by God, regardless of color. Okay? So um, I'm going to make sure that we're all on board with that. And if you're not, I would love to talk to you. If, if you are still holding on to just real deep-rooted racism and a belief that somehow we need to be isolated from them, I would love to interact with you about that because that needs to die. That spirit and that idea it just needs to die a, a, a quick and, and violent death. And, and, and that idea needs to be wiped off, especially amongst God's people. Okay? There is only us. And so, again, in the 90 plus percent white church, I ask you, in this situation, in this divide that clearly exists between white people and black people, are you us or them? And if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we're the us. We're the us. We are the beneficiaries of the privilege. We are the beneficiaries of the blessing. And the isolation is largely our fault. And it is our responsibility to do something about it. It is on us. And here's the thing that I know. Again, being a white person just like you, I know, and again, having a broad diversity, a broad diversity of people on my Facebook, on my Facebook feed. Very broad. Right? I understand that for a lot of people, it just feels kind of awkward. Like, may, maybe the deep-rooted racism in me is now gone. But that doesn't mean I know what to do. What am I supposed to do? You say, okay, well, I'm supposed to make this better. I'm supposed to make this better. What does that mean? What am I supposed to do? And what begins to happen is it kind of becomes kind of junior high dance-like, right? Junior high dance. The, the, the guy's on one wall and, and, and the girl's on the other wall. And so we're over here on this wall going, man, he's so black. Is that okay that he's so black? I don't know. It's African American, and that's what we're supposed to say. If I go over there and say black, then I'm gonna I'm gonna be in trouble. But African American is a lot of syllables, and I'm from the South, and we shorten everything. And I don't know what, I don't know what to say. I don't do it. If I walk over there, they're gonna think that I'm racist even for coming over there because I don't want to be one of those people that's like, well, I've got a black friend. Here's my black friend, and I think, oh, I said black. <laughs> and so we stay on our side of the road waiting or hoping that somehow that the, the, the girl will come over. But let's just say in the, in the culture, you may disagree with this culture, in the culture the guy needs to ask the girl on the date. And it is our responsibility to take the step. Now, again, more than any, more than any of the things that we talk about, this is going to need its own week. And, and, and people better than me, more knowledgeable about this, speaking into this more than I can. Okay? And, but at, at just a real simple... Just a real simple level. Here's some things that we can do. And the first one is, 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 is initiative. You need to take some initiative. You need to take some initiative, and then you need to listen. One of the healthiest things that has happened in our staff team over the last year, ZIV is a part of our, our staff team now, and there's just been some opportunities where we've just gotten a chance to listen and to hear a little bit about his experience and how vastly different his experience with this world is than all of our experience. If, if you have never done this, you should. You should ask someone you should ask someone of a different race, how many times have you been pulled over in your car? You will be stunned by what you hear. You, you won't, you, there will be a part of you that, that cognitive dissonance will, 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 will change. I'm sorry, I'm being, do the thing that my kids do. I'm saying things because I'm a kid. I, I can't believe it. Something breaks. It can't be true. But I listen. I initiate. I listen. And then I'm just going to believe what I hear. Way too often, I've got this group of facts. These are my facts. And I hear this group of facts. Well, your facts can't be true because these are my facts. And we're spending so much time trying to figure out whose facts are right. I'm not listening to the fact that what your reality has done to you and my responsibility in that. But if I will just simply, if I could just do that, I'm going to take initiative, I'm going to listen, and I'm going to believe. And in the process of doing this, I have heard some, some people say that, hey, yeah, I need you to take a lot of initiative with me. I feel different. I don't like being different here. I want initiative. And other people are like, hey, I don't like it that you pretend like I, want to, I wish I could blend in. Stop showing me special attention because I'm different. And so two different people, two different ideas. And the only way that I know that 
is the call to act. Now, obviously, there's way more that we can do. And again, we need to spend way more time talking about this, and we will. But at a minimum, I think it is important for us to do a, to do a better job on an individual basis of taking some initiative and loving people who historically have been othered by people like us. And, and we just need to take a little bit of responsibility. It is people like me that have othered and I think there's way too many, there's way too many white people out there saying, well, I didn't do that. Okay. That doesn't mean it's not your responsibility to make that change. Get over yourself. And recognize that even though it wasn't me, it was people like me. And I live under the benefit, and there are still people who are being othered by it. And it is my responsibility to go to them and make sure they know that we are us. Okay? So there's no them, there's just us. Regardless of what church you go to, regardless of the color of your skin, or the sin that you bring with you. Everybody walks in this room with something. I, I, they, I cannot think of a time that, um, that one person ever came to church saying, man, I'm just feeling perfect today. And I just want to experience and share my perfection with a world that definitely needs to experience it. That's just not why people come to church. People come to church because they are carrying some burden with them, and 99.9% .9 of those burdens are self-inflicted. There's something that you have done, there's something that you are, there's something that you are battling, and you come here hoping to hear a message of hope and restoration. That's why you come. And I'm telling you this, it does not matter what that thing is. It does not matter. You are going to find love and compassion here. It does not matter what it was. Because here's the thing that I feel I, it, that we've done. Again, not necessarily we, the big picture we. The big picture we thing that we have done is we've decided that if you come here and, 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 and you struggle with these things, then we can show you compassion and understanding. Because we all understand what it's like to struggle with these things. You struggle with these things. That, that's not a, that's not okay. We 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 got to keep that out. We can't have that here. That's not okay. And 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 so by 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 words or by attitude, we only accept people who have sins that we've decided are are normal. And I'm gonna use this example. This is an example from where I grew up. I grew up in a in a in a in a, in a split town. Racially, and I had the opportunity to hear these very two distinct things. I would hear people say, so and so is a good Christian, even though they're racist. Okay. I don't know if I have a category for that. I'm 12, but I don't know. And then you hear someone else say, this person is a good Christian, even though they constantly cheat on their spouse. Okay? And so, in two different cultures, one sin was a normal sin that we're battling, but it's okay. But this one, good grief. You can't, you can't say that. And you were impacted by one of those more than the other one. And hopefully we can be impacted by both of them and decide that they're both bad. But we've decided this is what we do. We decide that, 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 that something's normal. And so then what happens is we try, we're trying to figure out how do, we, how, how do you do this? How do you balance this? And so there's, there's these two kinds of churches, it seems. One is, is just kind of decide that everything's okay. Everything's okay. We're just not going to judge you about anything. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, no judgment. Everything's fine. Everything's good. And that doesn't help anybody. And then there's the, on the other end, there's these churches out there that just kind of keep, keep everybody in isolation. That I don't want to have to deal with the ugliness of whatever it is you're dealing with. And so we're going we're gonna to keep you in the parking lot. And we're just going to kind of put this invisible barrier up here that says, you, know, you just keep that out there. And so we're going to judge you even before you get here so we don't have to deal with the fact that there are people out there wrestling with some really bad stuff that is completely and totally foreign to us. But here's the thing that we've got to figure out. And again, going back to point one, we are not the only church. We're not the only church. Is trying to do this. There's some amazing churches out there. 
how do we how do we love you no matter who you are? help you overcome whatever it is. We're not, we're not going to judge you before you get in the door, but we're not going to tell you that when you get here that everything's fine because it's not fine. Because here's the thing that we do. We think somehow, this is what I'm going to do. It's important for me to stand for the truth. I'm going to stand for the truth. And by standing for the truth, I'm going to condemn that sin over there. But it's also important for me to be someone who understands grace. And so the sins that you and I both do, we need to understand this grace. And we make a little cross stitch that says, be patient with me. God's not done with me yet. I'm not perfect. I'm just forgiven. And we're learning about grace. And I also stand for the truth because of what they're doing. Which is ridiculous hypocrisy. And if we're going to be that inconsistent, we should go the other direction. I want to show them overwhelming grace. But you know what? We're really messed up. Because the thing that Jesus said in John chapter 3, he said, I haven't come here. I haven't come here to condemn the world. The world's condemned already. I've come that the world might be saved. And way too many of us, man, what, what, what we do is we think, well, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He handed that off to me. When in reality, what he did is he wants us to take over the work that he started. So yes, I condemn sin. I condemn it all. But the people here who sometimes we're supposed to like, we're supposed to make sure we take a stand and say, that's wrong. We make sure we, they, 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 they know. You know what? Those people, they already know. They've been condemned their whole life. And they're desperate for one place where they can find the hope, the truth of the gospel. Well, they're not good enough. You're not good enough. That's the point of the entire gospel. None of us are good enough. That's what we talked about last week. None of us are good enough. And it is only by the hope and grace and the overwhelming forgiveness of Jesus Christ. He didn't come here to forgive normal sin. He came here to forgive all of it. And here's what you're doing. talking about, it's very likely I'm talking about the thing that you're thinking, but I'm not going to say it because I don't want to let you off the hook, and I don't want to shame somebody because that's not what we're here to do. We are here to provide an environment that no matter what your background is, no matter what your sin is, no matter who you are, you are going to find the hope and grace and compassion and forgiveness of the gospel of Jesus Christ here. And so I want you to walk out of here feeling a little bit bad and a little bit good. I want you to feel like that your sin has been condemned and you have been offered the overwhelming grace and compassion of Jesus Christ and it does not matter what particular sin you are dealing with. You need to feel both of those things and that is who God has called us to be. And that's what it means for us to be us and there is no them. You hear once a story about somebody coming from this incredibly dark place. It's like, man, I just got here from prison. I got out of prison on Friday, and I'm here on Sunday. You hear it once, it's weird. You hear it five or six times, and it's crazy awesome. The people that God is bringing here to hear about the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers them, that's who we are. What do we need to do? There is something. There is one of those three in particular where you have othered people and it's time for you to make we. So let's pray. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray for this church. Let's pray for the big picture church that we can be a church that brings hope and life and the gospel of Jesus Christ to everybody. Lots of opportunities just kind of to physically respond. Communion is available in the back. There's prayer candles. There's prayer team that would love to pray with you. You can pray at the cross. We have an opportunity to give back. Lots of ways to physically respond. But let's pray for each other as individuals. Let's pray for our church and pray for the capital C church. 
that like Jesus described and like Paul talked about in Ephesians 2, that we all together will build one building whose foundation is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for everyone here. And God, I thank you for the people here who are the most different. And God, I pray that in real tangible ways that they are, will know that they are loved. And that, God, we would be known as a church that loved the, quote, worst sinners the way you did. And that, God, that we would bring the, the, the message of hope and forgiveness and reconciliation of your Son, Jesus Christ. That we would preach that to each other, to everyone who walks through this door, and to an entire world that desperately needs it. Give us the courage and the strength and the compassion, God, to build one building with you. We're thankful for your son who makes that possible. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.